Welcome to lecture 15 of corporate finance and we are going to discuss uh, theories of capital structure in this uh, video lecture. So moving towards the contents, we would first discuss uh, what capital structure is and somehow we have already seen uh, different aspects of capital structure. We have, we have discussed some ratios that are used to, to measure capital structure. And basic focus of this, uh, this lecture would be on the theories of capital structure. So what we would want to uh, do in this lecture is we would want to study different theories that are there in capital structure domain. And we would explore uh, these theories one by one. So moving forward, we start with three cases. And these three cases are based on certain assumptions. Now, remember whenever a theory is formed, there are always some assumptions attached to it, right? For example, the, the famous theory of, uh, you know, the law of demand and supply. What is the assumption there? It says the, uh, the increase in price would lead to decrease in demand, comma, keeping other things constant. So what is this keeping other things constant? This is basically the assumption of that theory. All theories do have certain assumptions and that's what make them theory, right? So uh, theories are designed for an idealistic environment and sometimes we then relax certain uh, assumptions to see how that theory performs or uh, in real life situation. So in real life situations, we would obviously have taxes and we would all we would have bankruptcy cost. By bankruptcy, we mean that um, the chances that the that the borrower would not be able to repay, right, uh, the amount. So there was there is some bankruptcy cost and some taxes attached uh, to debt. So what basically these theories are related to, they they they, they tell us whether capital structure do have an impact on firm performance, uh, firm value and uh, the VAC of the firm. So, so these are two elements that we are, uh, th these theories would uh, make us understand what is the effect of different capital structures, different debt to equity ratios on the firm value and its VAC. So coming back to our cases and then we would uh, discuss uh, these, these things in detail. So we have first case, this case one, where we take quite a idealistic uh, situation. We say that there are no taxes in the world and there, there is no bankruptcy cost. That means no matter how much the debt is raised, the firm would not have chances of bankruptcy and there would be no bankruptcy cost attached to it. Let's call this case irrelevant or irrelevance. Uh, theory right and we would discuss why we are calling it irrelevant so this is the case one and the assumptions are there are no taxes and no bankruptcy cost the case two uh, in case two we we relax the assumption of taxes so now we assume that there are taxes which 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 in actual scenario in real life world there are taxes but we still keep the uh, the, the, the no bankruptcy assumption intact and we want to see in this case do we want to see what is the impact of capital structure on firm value and weighted average cost of capital if we have taxes in the world but there is no bankruptcy cost right in the first case we want to see the effect of capital structure on firm value and VAC if there are no taxes no bankruptcy cost in second case we want to see the effect of capital structure on uh, from value and VAC if, if there are taxes but, but the, there is no bankruptcy cost. And in case 3, uh, we take the uh, uh, real world scenario and we relax both the assumptions. Now we say that there are taxes and there, 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 there is bankruptcy cost attached to, uh, to, to debt, to increasing debt. So moving forward, we will start with this case 1 in this video and in coming videos we will discuss the case 2 and case 3. Okay, so this uh, 
this first case is basically the the theory of Miller and Modigliani, which in short we call it MM theory or MNM theory. It was proposed in 1958 by Miller and Modigliani. They both authored a paper where they proposed this theory. So what this theory talks about, it, it proposes the relationship between capital structure, firm value and VAC. So what essentially this, this theory talks about is what is the effect of capital structure on firm value and uh, VAC. So, so if we increase debt, right, if we increase debt, what would happen to firm value? Would it increase? Would it decrease? What would happen to VAC? Would it increase? Would it decrease? So this basically all these three theories discuss about these two phenomena, these two aspects of the capital structure. So in this first uh, theory, we call it, uh, we also call it irrelevance theory. I just mentioned it, irrelevance theory. Or we call it uh, MM theory without taxes. Right. So we would call it MM theory without taxes. So moving forward, this theory proposes two prepositions. Preposition 1 is always related to the value of the firm and the preposition 2 is related to the VAC which we, we know we call it cost of capital. So if you do, do not understand what VAC is, there is a video uh, lecture that I have recorded uh, on VAC. You can find it. Uh, and you can come back to study this lecture. Okay, so uh, so uh, MM basically makes two conclusions. This is conclusion one, which is regarding value of the firm, right? And conclusion two is regarding evacuated average cost of capital. <clears throat> so what basically MM proposes is that it presents an analogy of a a pie. So when um, uh, basically the MM proposes that the value of the firm do not changes with change in capital structure. So uh, what essentially MM is saying that the capital structure is irrelevant. Now you would understand why we are calling this uh, MM theory without taxes. Uh, also we are calling it an irrelevant uh, theory right it isn't irrelevant per se but uh, what it says is that capital structure is irrelevant it doesn't affect the value of the firm and uh, MM proposes this theory uh, presents an uh, analogy of a pie uh, they, they say that it doesn't matter how do you divide the pie the size of the pie would still remain the same so by size of the pie, we mean the value of the firm. So um, so you can also say that uh, you order a pizza and you divide that pizza into four pieces, right? So this, the, the, the amount of pizza that you have ordered is the value of the firm. It doesn't matter how do you divide that pizza in how many pieces you, you divide that pizza it won't affect the size of the pizza, right? So similarly, it doesn't matter how do we divide the value of the, 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 the assets of the firm. So by divide, I mean we have asset sides. This asset size would remain intact. We are not changing this asset side. What we are essentially, we are doing is we are uh, changing this, this, uh, this right hand side of the balance sheet where we have liability and owner equity. So whether we have 60% liability and 40% owner equity or 40% liability and 60% owner equity, the asset would remain same. What we are changing is only the right hand side of the, uh, the equation or the, the balance sheet. So the, 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 the proposition says capital structure is irrelevant. Okay, so according to proposition one, the value of the firm is independent of the firm uh, capital structure. It is to, to say it, capital structure do not affect the value of the firm. 
So the value of the leveraged firm, by leveraged firm we mean the, the firm that have debt in its capital structure, some of its assets are financed by debt, is equal to the value of unleveraged firm. So what essentially we are saying is that VL is equal to VU, value of leveraged firm is equal to value of unleveraged firm. This was proposition 1. We are going to pro prove this proposition in a while, uh, but uh, stick with this one uh, and, and you would understand the intuition. So moving on to proposition 2, remember proposition 1 was related to value of the firm. Proposition 2 is related to the cost of capital. or what we call weighted average cost of capital. So the proposition uh, that a firm's cost of equity capital is a positive linear function of the uh, firm's capital structure. Now you know that cost of capital is divided into cost of equity and cost of debt. So what this proposition 2 says is that as debt would increase, the firm with more debt, its cost of equity would also increase. Right? That means that the, the finances that we have got from the owners or the shareholders, they would demand a higher return. And they would demand higher return because as debt increases, financial risk increases. But we would come back to that in a while. So we know that VAC is equal to uh, the weight of equity into cost of equity plus the weight of debt into cost of debt. And if we rearrange this equation, then we get that cost of equity is equal to uh, the required rate of return plus required rate of return minus the cost of debt into debt to equity ratio. So, uh, if there are no taxes, then we would calculate cost of equity using this equation, right? I repeat, if there are no taxes or according to MM theory without taxes, we would calculate the cost of equity using this equation. This part of cost of capital, this part of the VAC would be calculated using this equation. The rest we would come back to. Okay. So, but VAC would remain same. So, what it, it is saying is that this is VAC and this VAC comes from cost of uh, equity, which we denote by RE and cost of debt, which we denote by RD. It says that although cost of equity would increase but VAC would remain same. Why is that so? VAC remains same as debt to equity ratio changes, that is the firm's overall cost of capital is unaffected by its capital structure. Why is that so? Because the cost of debt is lower than cost of equity. So this, this cost, cost of debt is lower than cost of equity. So, uh, the change in capital structure weight is exactly offset by change in the cost of equity. So as we increase debt, debt is lower, uh, its cost is lower. Although the by increasing debt, the, the cost of equity would increase, but the VAC would remain same because that increase in cost of equity would be offset, would be balanced by the cheaper uh, cost of debt, right? Okay, so what essentially uh, MM proposition to uh, one said is that value of the firm do not change due to uh, a change in uh, capital structure and proposition 2 says that VAC do not change
change due to change in capital structure. So now you know exactly wh why we call it irrelevance theory. Okay, so let's have an example. And this example would make it clear that how although cost of equity increases but VAC remains same. So this would be related to this second preposition, right? Once we understand the second proposition, we would come back to the first one. Okay, uh, the Ricardo Corporation has a weighted average cost of capital uh, or the required rate of return of 12%. Uh, it can borrow at 8%. So the cost of that would be 8% RD. Assume that Ricardo has a target capital structure of 80% equity and 20% debt. What is the cost of equity? So remember, we need to calculate cost of equity. And in previous slide, I mentioned that to calculate cost of equity in case of uh, no taxes, uh, that is to say that MM uh, preposition MM theory without taxes, we use this equation, right? So we calculate cost of equity. So this cost of equity would be equal to uh, 0.12, which is the, the required rate of return into 0.12 minus RD, RD in this case is 0 0.08 into debt to equity ratio. So in this case, uh, debt is 20% and equity is 80%. Okay, so this would give us a cost of equity of uh, 0.13 or we can say 13%. Now what? Now we need to use the VAC equation. So VAC is, we have cost of equity, we need to find VAC. VAC is um, the weight of uh, equity into cost of equity plus the weight of debt into cost of debt. So we know that weight of equity is 80% and cost of equity we just calculated is 13%. Cost of debt is 20% and uh, sorry, weight of debt is 20% and the cost of debt is mentioned 8%. Uh, this gives us a VAC of 0 0.12 or 12%. Okay. So let's move forward. Just remember that in this case, VAC is 12% and cost of equity is 13%. Now imagine using the same uh, data, we need to calculate the cost of equity and the VAC again if the debt to equity ratio changes. So this would give us an idea that if debt increases the debt to equity changes what is its impact on cost of equity and its impact on the VAC. So let's just calculate cost of equity. So cost of equity would again be RA is equal to RA plus again RA minus RD into debt to equity, right? And if we add the information, then that would be, we have same cost of equity, same cost. Uh, we, we are just changing the uh, debt to equity ratio. In this case, the debt to equity ratio would be, sorry, 50 by 50. So that would be equal to uh, one. So this would give us 0.16 or 16%. So now just remember that by increasing debt, the cost of equity went up. And that is what we mentioned, uh, that is what MM uh, theory proposed, that the cost of equity would increase by increasing debt. Let's see what happened to VAC. So we have VAC, uh, the weight of equity into cost of equity plus the, the weight of debt into cost of debt. So the weight in this case would be 0 0.50 into cost would be 0.16 plus 0 0.50 into 
0.08. So we just changed the weight and the, the new cost of equity we have incorporated. And you would be amazed to see that the VAC turns out to be same. So what did MM theory without taxes proposed? It said increase the debt, the cost of equity would increase, but VAC would remain same. And this is quite uh, intuitively explained by this, this image. It, this is cost of debt. The cost of debt remains same no matter whether you increase the, the debt to equity ratio or not. So in the first scenario when the debt to equity ratio uh, was lower, we had 80% equity and 20% debt. Still the cost of debt was 8% and when uh, in case when we increased the debt, uh, we had 50% uh, debt and 50% equity. In, the, in that case also the cost of debt was same, that is 8%. But what happened in the previous case, the, the cost of equity was, uh, sorry, 13%, but uh, after increasing the debt to equity ratio, as we increased, the cost of equity increased, but VAC remains, remained same at both these debt to equity ratios. So the cost of equity arises as the firm increases its use of debt financing. But why do cost of equity increases? So the rise of equity depends, uh, the risk of equity, sorry, depends on uh, two things. First one is the business risk and the, the business risk by means the riskiness of the firm's asset if there is no debt. So that is the usual risk of the business. So the equity risk that comes from the nature of the firm's operating equity, the riskiness of the firm's operations, right? And the main uh, risk that we are interested in here is in the financial risk. It is the additional risk placed on the common shareholder as the result of using debt. So as we increase debt, the financial risk of the shareholder increases and when the financial risk of the shareholder increases, they would obviously demand a higher return risk premium over uh, over non-leveraged firm, right? So the equity risk that comes from the financial policy that is capital structure, the higher the capital stuck, the higher the debt, the higher would be the financial risk and that was, that's what would increase the cost of equity. Okay, so there are certain uh, factors that would increase business risk, we would just uh, go through them. Uh, demand variability. So uh, when there is there is a firm whose demand is uncertain, its operational risk, its sorry, its business risk would be higher as compared to the firm uh, whose uh, whose demand is constant. Similarly, sales price firm whose products are sold in high volatile market where this price in is highly volatile. For example, oil, uh, crude oil that fund would have higher business risk. If the input cost variability, that means that the firm whose uh, input costs are highly uncertain, their raw material cost is highly uncertain, its business risk is also high. For example, uh, the airline companies, their raw material is crude oil. So if the price of oil is uncertain, their input cost is higher. So the point of these factors is to explain that what are different uh, different elements that increase the business risk. But what I would like to focus is on this image uh, is that without uh, so you see the, we, we have the the risk free rate so any investor investing in, in risk free assets would earn this much percentage of return let's just say 6% but in investing in business with higher business risk, investor would demand certain higher return. Say for example, now the demand 12%. But this additional increase in uh, 
required rate of return of equity or cost of equity the required rate of return of equity for the investor would become the cost of equity for the for the corporation so this this is coming from the debt to equity ratio so as we increase debt to equity ratio or as we increase debt the cost of equity is increases and that is because the investor is demanding premium for a higher financial risk 